It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My first question is to the Premier. The Premier is removing 10,000 teachers from schools and cramming more students into crowded classrooms. High school students could be stuck Government in classes side, with as many order. as 40 students, and that's when uh, they're not forced to take classes by YouTube. How will removing thousands of teachers from classrooms and putting students into online courses actually help students learn? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I, I just can't believe the Leader of the Opposition can, can be untruthful. And, and I'm going to ask the Premier to withdraw. Withdraw. He conclude his response. What's that? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, we all know, we all know in this chamber that there's not going to be any layoffs in education whatsoever. There won't be 10,000 teachers. That's scaremongering. That's going back to the old tactics of what we've seen in the last 15 years. 15 years of ignoring teachers, 15 years ignoring parents, and 15 years of ignoring students. We're going back to the basics, Mr. Speaker. Yep, we we're go. going back to make Ms. sure Thomas. our grade six students are aren't on the bottom a tier of the whole country when it comes to math. One third of our teachers are failing the same math test. We're going to support our teachers to make sure. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. <laughs> Members, please take your seats. We start the clock. Supplementary. The government says high school students will be required to take four classes online instead of getting in-person instruction. Under the Ford government, regardless of what the best learning environment is for students or if they need any one-on-one -on -one attention, students will be spending more time learning from Google. Is that how the Premier thinks he will boost student achievements? Premier? Through through you, Mr. Speaker, you can see how out of date the Leader of the Opposition is. It's already happening. It's already happening. We're focusing on technology as well. We see it in our colleges and universities, online courses, and we're going to keep up with technology. It's about making sure our students are taught properly, not uh, taught the last 15 years that we're in the lowest tier when it comes to arithmetic, when it comes to reading and writing, we're going back to the basics, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. We're going to be making sure our students have a proper education. Here, here. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, here's the Ford government plan for our kids. Fewer teachers, larger Inside classes, more Googling. The Premier says he consulted with parents. Can he tell us how many of those parents asked for larger class sizes and learning from YouTube? Premier. Mr. Speaker, the largest consultation in the history of this country, in the history of this province, well, took place. They took place. Listen to the people. We listen to the people. 72,000 parents spoke out. That includes teachers, yep. students, and parents. We're doing something that no other government has ever done, and that's actually listen to the teachers. We're listening to the parents. We're focusing on education, making sure our students are ready to get into the workplace because we're going to need them. You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because we've created in the last three months almost 100,000 new jobs. That's why we need them. Here, here. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est bien. Thank you. To the Premier. This week, the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston, a veteran Conservative MPP, made disturbing allegations that the Premier's hand-picked Chief of Staff, Dean 
French and other senior operatives within his government were engaged in, quote, illegal and unregistered order. lobbying by friends Let's of the side, Premier. Come to order. Was the Premier or anyone in his inner circle engaged in, quote, illegal and unregistered lobbying by friends of the Premier? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, here goes the ironic situation that we face every single day in the ledge here. Telling stories, telling stories, Mr. Speaker. We aren't asking for cash for access. The NDP were putting cash for access. Pay $800 to have the luxury and have a reward to meet the leader of the opposition. That's $800. That's unacceptable. We don't ask for $800. We ask for $25 for spaghetti dinners. We ask them to pick up the cell phone and give us a call. We don't need any lobbyists like the Leader of the Opposition does. She sits there and talks to the heads of the unions every day. They support her. They fund her. That's what it's all about, making sure they continue to stick their hands in the taxpayer's Response. pocket. They don't worry about taxpayers. They worry about themselves, Mr. Speaker. Order. I'm going to caution all members in terms of intemperate language. It's so loud in here already, I can hardly hear. Of course, the Speaker has a responsibility to try to maintain order, but I need the cooperation of members in order to do that. If necessary, I will warn members, and if they continue with this sort of behaviour, I'll have no choice but to begin naming members. I would ask all members to keep that in mind and ensure that their language is parliamentary and not intemperate so as to inflame other members. This is the Provincial Parliament of Ontario. Let's remember that. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It is the uh, provincial parliament where this government actually brought cash for access back to Ontario, so it's pretty rich that the Premier is now complaining about the very legislation that he brought forward, one-upping the Liberals. Uh, did the, minister, the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston ever speak to the Premier or his chief of staff, Dean French, or any members of the Cabinet about his concerns with possible illegal activities? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, you know, and everyone knows, there's no illegal activity outside of posting a fundraiser four days before it takes place. Which they did. Which the NDP did, Mr. Yep. Speaker. Yep. Mr. Speaker, you're supposed to post it seven days before. They broke the law. They know they broke the law. It was four days, $800 access. I wouldn't pay eight cents to have access to the NDP. Not mentioning the eight hundred dollars. Stop the clock. Order. Order. The House will come to order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Before I actually ask the next question, I want to remind the Premier that he is in a room full of witnesses here. Mm -hmm. Has the Premier heard any complaint from any source whatsoever about possible, quote, illegal and unregistered lobbying against members of his senior team? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, the only illegal lobbying I've ever heard about is through the NDP. Exactly. When they meet with their heads of their unions, yeah. the public sector unions, yeah. and as I said yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I feel sorry for the frontline public sector union members that totally disagree with the socialist mentality that the opposition has brought to this chamber. Mr. Speaker, they don't want their union dues going there. They want their union dues making sure that they're taken care of, not to a political party. They respect the work that we're doing. They respect the work that we're reducing gas prices, reducing taxes, making sure we put more money in their pocket. We're fighting against the terrible, terrible tax, the carbon tax that could possibly put us into a carbon recession as of April the 1st. That's what their Response. members are worried about, not supporting the leader of the NDP to celebrate her 10 years of being leader. 
Order. Next question. The next question. Start the clock. Next question, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Maybe I'll get an answer this time. A veteran Conservative MPP made disturbing allegations about the conduct of the Premier's senior staff team and described the chill the Premier's team has put on dissent within the government. Was the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston expelled from the PC caucus because he disagreed with the Premier's Chief of Staff's lobbying practices? Response, Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, this is just gutter politics right now yeah. that we see in, yep. in, in this chamber. The resistance. And it's, you, you know, they, they, they're wanting to fight, but since I've been in the chamber for the last eight months, Mr. Yes, Speaker, I have yet to hear one idea. The opposition has come up was to save the taxpayers' money. Nothing. They believe in one mentality. It's spend, 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 tax, tax, tax. That's what they believe in. We believe in saving the taxpayers' money, putting more money back into their pocket, making sure we create an environment that this province is going to thrive, that people in the province will thrive and be more prosperous and grow. And we've proved it. Companies around this province, they are so excited that they're able to reinvest in this province and hire again 100,000 new people in the private sector. That's more than the United States. Yep. This province is on fire right now, and we're going to continue. Stop the clock. Members take their seats. Start the clock. Supplementary. It is confident that his hand-picked chief of staff, Dean French, and his senior staff team have not engaged in any quote-unquote illegal activity, will he order them to fully cooperate with any investigation into the matter? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, do you know what the province is terrified about right now is April the 1st? April the 1st. Yep. Position come to order. They're terrified about April the 1st. Yep. Miss Jones is worried about driving her kid to school, back and forth to the sports facility, because guess what, Mr. Speaker? Mrs. Jones is going to be paying a lot more. Mrs. Jones, when she goes to the grocery store, that's going to go up in cost. Yep. Everything's going up in cost for what? A fake carbon tax? It's a tax. They put the word carbon in front of it. It does nothing for the environment. What we've done for the environment, and the Minister of Environment's done an incredible job, we reduce emissions by 22 percent. We're leading the entire country in emissions reduction. That's true leadership. There we go. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. I need to be able to hear the member that has the next question. Start the clock. The member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm certainly looking forward to this answer. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. By cancelling Liberal fee increases on hunting and fishing licenses, removing the $2 service fee, and doubling the number of license fee free fishing events, we are making these great sports more accessible and affordable for all Ontarians. We have also honoured our heroes, the veterans and serving members of the Canadian Armed Forces, by giving them the option to fish for free in Ontario. Like many of my constituents, there's nothing better than enjoying Ontario's beautiful outdoors. 
That's why it was great to see the Premier attend the Toronto Sportsman Show this last weekend. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier update the Legislature on how our government for the people is continuing to make life easier for hunters and anglers? Good. Thank you. Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the great MPP from Perth Wellington. Mr. Speaker, as you can see, we've taken a different approach to government. We're actually putting more money back into people's pockets. When it comes to the fishermen and the anglers and the hunters and the hunters, we froze the fees. When it came to the car registration, we froze the fees. When it came to beer and alcohol, we froze the fees. That's actually saving the common person money. And our great veterans and the people that serve to protect this country, they'll have zero fees. They won't have to worry about getting a license. They put their lives on the line every day. It's about time we start respecting it. Respecting these people. I know the opposition doesn't respect them, but we respect them. I can assure you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker uh, to the Premier, I want to thank the Premier for that answer. I know that my constituents in Perth Wellington will be pleased to hear that under the leadership of the Premier, our government is on their side and committed to making life easier and more affordable. Hunting and angling is a part of our culture in Ontario, but it is an also an important part of our economy. After 15 years of out-of-control spending by the past Liberal government, it is, uh, it is great to uh, see that Ontario is finally open for business and open for jobs. Here, here. Can the Premier speak to the important role that hunting and angling, and angling plays in our economy? Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, myself and the numerous amounts of MPPs from our caucus ended up going to the sportsman show. I call them the real people. You get out of the bubble, you get out of the, the downtown elites and a bunch of lefties downtown that all want to do is tax and spend. You get to the real people. That's the outdoors people, the rural folks. We met at the sportsman show. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there was thousands of people there. I couldn't walk an inch. I couldn't even take a step without people coming up to me and saying, Doug, keep going. You're doing a great job. We thank you for doing what you're doing, protecting the real people of this province, the hardworking people that like to go out once in a while and do a little bit of fishing, a little bit of hunting. Those are the real folks. Yep. Get yourself Response. out of the bubble and listen to the folks in the rural areas. Yeah. Order. Next question, the member for Essex. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Okay. Government side, come to order. Start the clock. The member I has a chance to place his question. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the member for Lanark Front at Kingston has raised serious concerns about the way that this government conducts business. He alleges that once the Premier and his insider friends came to Queen's Park, many newly elected MPPs were taken advantage of by, quote, backroom operatives. He also raised concerns about, quote, illegal and unregistered lobbying by close friends and advisors employed by the Premier. Speaker, the member is a veteran PC MPP with over a decade of service in this House. I don't often agree with that member, but he's always struck me as an honest person. Speaker, why should Ontarians believe that the Order. Premier, when he says that this member is making it Question. up? Premier. <laughs> You know, Mr. Speaker, I, again, I find it ironic coming from the MPP from Essex. When I got a, a call from one of his buddies saying, I find it, he, they watched the, the show, as we call it, yesterday, and he says he finds it ironic when he got a call from the MPP from Essex pushing an $800 illegal wine and dine with a leader. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to caution the Premier on his, his use of language. You can't say that. Okay. Withdraw. Complete your answer, please. What the people are worried about 
is their taxes. They worry about the pocketbook issues. They're tired of being gouged by all three levels of government. They finally see some light at the end of the tunnel with our government right across the board. We're reducing taxes. We're creating good jobs. Response. We're creating an economy that is just absolutely booming right now. And it's not a coincidence it's booming. We create an environment to thrive and prosper and grow in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'll try to be a bit more gentle with the Premier because this seems to be a little bit of a sensitive issue for him. Speaker, the member for Lanark Frontenac Kingston has raised serious concerns about the way this government conducts its business. Speaker, if the Premier is so confident that he's done no wrong and it's his former caucus member who's making these inaccurate claims, will he call the OPP now and invite them to investigate? Will he do the right thing and call the OPP? Open the door to truth and transparency. Premier to reply. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I can't wait to call the OPP on illegal fundraising that the NDP are doing. And I, I'm sorry, and ask the Premier to withdraw. Withdraw. <laughs> and complete his answer. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Speaker, as I was saying, I have no problem calling the OPP to investigate how the fundraising is going with the NDP. That's what I'm concerned about. You can't be going around saying, here's $800 to have access to the leader of the NDP. Again, we're a little different. All you have to do, unlike yourselves, all you have to do is pick up Thank you. Next question. Member for Davin. Oh, sorry. Next question. The member for Durham. 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 Member for Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Yesterday, the minister released the results of the 2018 Student Voices on Sexual Violence survey. Speaker, the results of the survey are heartbreaking and disturbing. They show that far too many of our students are experiencing sexual violence on our campuses. Speaker, one instance of sexual violence, harassment, stalking, or assault on our campuses is one too many. The results of the survey show that we need to do more. Can the minister tell us more about the results of this important survey? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Durham for that, uh, for that question and for her good work. Our government takes the safety and well-being of our students very seriously, and I want to thank the thousands of students who had the courage to share their experiences. And as the member notes, the results of the survey are heartbreaking and disturbing. We know that of the over 116,000 university students who completed the survey, roughly 63% experienced some type of sexual harassment. And in the college sector of the over 42,000 students who completed the survey, just under 50% experienced sexual harassment. Speaker, this is not acceptable. I want to work with students institutions and all Ontarians to improve campus safety and I am looking forward to sharing the immediate steps our government announced yesterday in the supplemental thank you speaker thank you supplementary question thank you speaker and thank you to the minister for your transparency in sharing the details of this survey it's clear that the status quo is not good enough and we need to take more action Speaker, this is an opportunity to have an honest and open discussion about how we can do better. I know that the minister and, in fact, all members of the chamber will agree that we need to work together as legislators and as Ontarians to make our campuses safer. Can the minister tell us what immediate steps our government is taking to improve campus safety in light of this survey? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And the member is absolutely right that the status quo is not good enough. 
And that is why yesterday I announced various measures to improve campus safety. We will double the Women's Campus Safety Grant, double it, to support universities and colleges in preventing incidents of sexual violence on campus. And we will require every university and college to report annually to their Board of Governors on sexual violence on their campuses and to have a task force devoted to tackling sexual violence on campus and to review their sexual violence policies Order. by September 2019. Speaker, I believe that, that these measures will help address sexual violence and harassment on campus. And I am committed to working with students, universities, and colleges to prevent sexual violence on campuses across Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education in Ontario. We have a French language education system that's doing great. The French language Catholic school boards are growing thanks to the growing number of registrations. Represent representatives of this sector came to Queen's Park recently to tell us that the government's decisions could have a harmful effect on French language instruction. Decisions like that of Friday concerning the increase of the number of students per class mean that small francophone schools will be forced to offer fewer classes and for school boards that are already having difficulty in attracting qualified teachers, cutting the number of positions will just make the situation worse. Has the minister considered the impact that her cuts will have on francophone school boards? Very much, Mr. Speaker. Merci beaucoup pour question. Thank you very much for your question. On anglais, uh, out of respect for our French-speaking Ontarians, uh, so they'll appreciate that. Yeah, they they know what I mean. So, Speaker, Speaker, in all seriousness, I find the game that the opposition party to be very offensive. This game that they're trying to play, the narrative they're trying to create, is absolutely wrong. We stand by our francophone students, we stand by our francophone teachers, and I can tell you the organizations that do a wonderful job lobbying and advocating on behalf of our francophone education system in Ontario do a wonderful job, and we've got a great relationship, not only myself, but the Minister of Francophone Affairs, her PA, Response. my PA, and the, our absolutely diverse caucus that we have sitting in the PC government. We know what's needed to get francophone education absolutely secure in this province, and that is support. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Mr. Mr. Speaker, that's not good enough. Billion dollars and 10,000 teachers out of our school system doesn't make sense. For francophone students, it doesn't make sense. For francophone schools, it doesn't make sense for any student. This morning, the minister on CBC Radio was asked how taking teachers out of classrooms would help students. She said she was doing this to build resiliency. I guess that's a uh, tough love approach. But anyways, does the minister Order. actually believe that she is doing students a favour by taking away their teachers? Nice. Minister? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, to start off, I have to say I think somebody needs two minutes for fake laughing because really and truly, <laughs> this is ridiculous. The narrative the opposition party is trying to create is absolutely ridiculous. Let me tell you, Speaker, that we're investing in education, and I feel good about the plan that's going to work for you, your kids, your grandchildren, our teachers, our students, our employers, everyone in Ontario, because we're getting back to the basics, and we're going to be fun funding and investing in math qualifications, additional qualification courses for our students. We're investing in an, a top priority, which is always the learning environment in a perfect classroom scenario. And we're going to be standing by our teachers. Uh, speaker, again, like I stand, stand today and correct the member opposite 
in full clarity. Not one person will involuntarily lose their job. We're going to be investing in school boards to Stop the clock. Members take their seats. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Speaker, and my question today is for the Premier. I think it's an appropriate question given we have so many young people here today. It's a question of ethics. Speaker, through you to the Premier, two days ago, Mr. Hillier made us aware of some of the outrageous actions your government has taken behind closed doors. He describes the back door and big corporate interests into the Premier's office through Dean French and Chris Frogart. Has the Premier done anything since taking office to make sure that his staff and ministry staff have the information that they need to ensure that they are not breaking the law? Do they have the training, the knowledge that they need to be able to urge corporations to make sure that they are registered lobbyists and that their lobbyists are registered appropriately? What is the Premier doing to make sure that his office operates within the limits of the law? Excellent question. I look to the Deputy Premier to respond. To the Minister of Economic Development. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Growth. Uh, thanks, Speaker, uh, and I can uh, assure you, and I can assure the House, and I can assure everybody watching uh, that the claims have been made by the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston are completely unsubstantiated. There is no truth to any of these. As a matter of fact, the member has not provided any evidence whatsoever other than making some claims in a letter. There has been absolutely no evidence that anything occurred, and I can tell you that the Premier, the Premier's office and our government are acting with complete integrity. We knew that when the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston was initially expelled from the caucus for some comments that he made. There were other issues as well that we needed to look at, Mr. Speaker. As a matter of fact, the Premier really wanted Spons? to give uh, the member a larger voice in our caucus, but the member chose to go in another direction, and I think it's very harmful to government in general. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the minister. He talks about no evidence. What I would ask this government is if you have nothing to hide, why not provide us now with a list of all the meetings the Premier and his staff have had since taking office? Will the Premier tell us where he and his staff have been? Would you cooperate with the Integrity Commissioner to have a full review of all meetings by you and all members of your staff, including Dean French and Chris Frogert, yes or no? The Minister. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. And it's unfortunate that the, these claims, which are completely unsubstantiated, they're absurd and they're categorically false, continue to occupy space here in the Ontario Legislature. And let me remind the member opposite that it was actually her government that had not one, not two, not three, not four, but five OPP investigations while they were in government. Five OPP investigations. And there actually was evidence, Mr. Speaker. There was evidence that needed to be looked at. I remind the government members that the Minister of Economic Development Job Creation has the floor. Stop the clock. <laughs> and I can't hear him, and we're very close. <laughs> I don't know why they'd be heckling their minister as he responds and interjecting. Please start the clock and let the minister conclude his response. Mr. Speaker, I would uh, say that if there was anything in the letter that Mr. Hillier sent that was true, you know, why didn't he act earlier? Clearly, he was expelled from the PC caucus Response. for a reason, and that was because he just didn't want to be a part of, of the team. He didn't want to show up to work, and I can see a similar thing occurring. Thank you. I will remind all members, in case they've forgotten, that it's inappropriate to make reference to the absence of another member at any time, and all of us, from time to time, have been away from the Legislature during a sitting day, generally for a good reason in most cases, I think, and that's why we don't do it. For anybody who needs a reminder, there's a reason why we don't do that, because all of us individually might be away on any given day. Any of us might be away. 
shouldn't need to keep reminding people of that. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, my question is for uh, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Today, we're celebrating uh, the uh, Francophone Affairs Day. I know for Francophones and Francophiles in Mississauga Centre and everywhere in the province, this day is very important. We are underlying the contribution, contributions and the rich history of the Francophones that is over 400 years. Since our election, we expressed our willingness to promote the Franco-Ontarians' rights. Does the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport can talk to us about the vision of our government for the Ontario population with respect to the Francophone interests? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you for the MPP for her question, Mr. Speaker. Firstly, I would like to wish all of the Francophones in Ontario greetings. French and bilingualism is something good for Ontario. Our government committed to be open to others. Several meetings with uh, key stakeholders in the business, business world helped us uh, to identify the obstacles in the enterprises and the businesses and how uh, to improve the lives of Francophones in Ontario. We will continue to be open to education for and for access, for French access and education and health and justice. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the, thank you for his answer. Thank you uh, for, uh, thank you to the Minister of Francophone Affairs for listening to the francophones. Mr. Speaker, my uh, constituents, as well as the majority of francophones, uh, would like the federal government uh, gives its uh, fair part to Ontario. The uh, president of the Treasury Board, uh, could, uh, could he please talk about uh, the Ontario stakeholders? with respect to Francophone affairs. You have to refer the question if you're going to refer it. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government continues to challenge the Trudeau government and wants the funding for the Francophone Affairs in Ontario. The, govern the federal government owes money for Francophone Affairs in Ontario. New Brunswick receives $7.31 and Manitoba $35.71. Mr. Speaker, our position is that if the federal Liberals were really committed to in, uh, investing in the Franco Francophone affairs, it would uh, increase their contribution in the French services in Ontario so that we could better meet the needs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Premier. Today, we had the visit, uh, visit of the Francophone uh, representatives uh, to, and its objective is to uh, convey information to people. But this time, it's uh, the opposite that's happening. It's the Franco-Ontarian that came to tell you to make you hear what the Franco-Ontarians uh, have been asking since 2018, meaning to put back the French language commissioner 
as an independent office and to restore the funding of the French university. What do Franco-Ontarians must do so that you could understand what we are wishing for? The Premier to the Premier. Questions referred to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Merci, merci, Monsieur le Président. Je pense que Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think that it's within the government where we could have the biggest impact. And the minister will continue to work to move forward with important files. We know that prosperity and francophone communities go through economy first. So we are working to make sure that we have economic growth and reducing uh, red tape. The services are a priority for our government. That's why we are working on modernization on the French Language Act. We are working to protect and improve the services, the frontline services in French and in education and in health and in mental health. We are also working in improving access to justice. Thank you. Good question. Mr. Speaker, it is deceiving to see that this in this inter International Day of Francophone Affairs. Parliamentary comment. <laughs> Once again, these people did not come here to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario out of politeness just to visit you. They actually came here to you remind you that the Conservative government did, did ignored our community. We heard several times that the transfer of the commissioner to the ombudsman was only for financial reasons, but the ombudsman admitted that he will need new money uh, to uh, greet the uh, new team. And you didn't understand that nobody uh, will be laid off. Will you be listening to the Franco-Ontarians, yes or no? Minister. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government announced that we will propose uh, amendments uh, to Bill 57. Uh, from 2018 uh, to restore responsibility and transparency. These coherent, these amendments will create the position of commissioner within the office of the ombudsman. Our objective is to find the best way to protect the francophones in Ontario while respecting uh, the taxpayers' money. These amendments will make sure that we will have scale economies and we'll make sure that the office will be functioning well. But the commissioner will still table his reports at the Legislative Assembly. The commissioner will have the responsibility to investigate and to give his reports at the Legislative Assembly. The next question, member for Scarborough Agent Court. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Our government has been taking definitive action to put more money in people's pocket and open Ontario for business and for jobs. We are cutting the red tape, reducing the regulatory burden businesses faces, and providing relief to families and individuals. Order. At the same time, we are cleaning up the financial mass left behind by the previous Liberal government. Our government is taking... Please stop the clock. Apologize to the member for Scarborough, Agent Court. I'm going to ask the member for Waterloo to come to order, the member for Essex to come to order, and the Minister of Education to come to order. Start the clock. Apologize to the member. Please conclude your question. Our government is taking bold action 
Yesterday, we hope to find a federal partner committed to restoring Canada's business competitiveness and protecting jobs. However, we were once again disappointed by the federal government's inaction. Could the minister please inform the House how yesterday's federal budget will impact Ontario? Minister Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Scarborough Agent Park. Yesterday's budget confirms the federal government does not share our vision for making Ontario open for business or open for jobs. The federal government is threatening manufacturing and small business jobs in Ontario and hurting families with their job-killing carbon tax. On April 1, the federal government will reverse the relief that our government has brought to families and businesses. The federally imposed carbon tax will immediately raise the price of gasoline by 4.4 cents a litre, and it will make it more expensive to heat your homes, buy your food for your families. We had hoped the federal government would have taken note of the success that we've had in Ontario and maybe followed suit, but despite their lack of action, our government will Thoughts? continue to restore our province's finances, cut red tape, and make Ontario open for business and open for yes. jobs. Please take your seats. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It is disappointing to see the inaction of the federal government. Time and time again, Premier Ford and our government have raised the alarm over the federal, federally imposed carbon tax coming on April 1st. However, the people of Ontario can be sure that this government and this premier will not stop fighting for them. We know our plan is working. For the past nine months, our government has been working hard to reduce Ontario's deficit, cut red, red tape for businesses, and create a pro-job environment. And we are seeing the results. Could the minister please explain to the House the successes our government has seen and why the federal government should follow suit. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. In just nine months, our government has added 132,000 new jobs. Once again, we are seeing Ontario businesses investing again, creating jobs and growing our economy. The inaction of the federal government fails to build upon the success of the province of Ontario. And, Speaker, we have concerns with the package of concessions the federal government accepted under the Canada-U.S.-Mexico agreement in our agricultural sector. We continue to call on the federal government to oppose the new Here. Buy America provisions that would negatively affect Ontario business and workers, and we expect the federal government to continue to press the U.S. for immediate and permanent removal of tariffs on our steel and aluminum. We will continue to build on our government's success and make Ontario open for business and open for Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish uh, you and two parliamentaries, Franco-Ontarians, men and women, a good international day. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care for many Franco-Ontarian men and women planification of services uh, give access to services not available before, and the access is better than before in hospital long-term care establishment. Now that the government removed Université Française de l'Ontario and Commissioner of Language Services Act, what will happen with planification entities. To the minister, what guarantee can she offer 
that the identities will be maintained. We'll have decision-making process. And where will they be in the new executive structure? Minister of Health. Um, the the uh, services that Franco-Ontarians receive in health care um, are not um, uniform across the province. We know that. We know that there are um, a lack of people who are uh, trained and in service right now in several areas, personal support workers, registered nurses in certain parts of the province in particular. We are conducting a human resources review with a particular emphasis on making sure that people are able to communicate in their first language with the people who provide them with health care services. They, I know that that is a particular concern to uh, people in the Franco-Ontarian community especially with respect to mental health services, because communication is vital in those areas. It is an area that we are working on right now within the ministry to make sure that we have the proper human resource mix in each of the areas, hospitals, long-term care homes, Response. and in-home care as well. That's a great answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. The minister is right. We lack uh, personnel in Northern Ontario and in Eastern Ontario as well. And this affects uh, Franco-Ontarian uh, in a different manner. If you have 90 years old, um, your wife, you never work, you always spoke French, you need help at home, and the person who comes to provide services doesn't speak French. This is reality of many Franco-Ontarians men and women, particularly in northern and eastern Ontario, where within the bill we see a concrete strategy to compensate for the lack of personnel, because uh, I don't see it. Minister? Well, the member will know this has been a, an issue for quite some time. In fact, when we served together on the Select Committee on Mental Health and Addictions 10 years ago, uh, we did note that this was a particular concern uh, for Franco-Ontarians not receiving uh, services in their first language. We are continuing to work on that. Nothing much, I, I'm sorry to say, has happened in that time, sorry, but we are going to work on that and in the new Ontario health teams that are going to be developed at the local basis. Those teams will be responsible for making sure that all of the people that live within the geographic region that they serve are going to be able to receive languages in their first language. So that will be French, it may be other languages, but we want to make sure that every person in Ontario will be able to get the right services for them when and where they need them, and that includes speaking French. Uh, as it is the first language of many uh, many Ontarians, Response. particularly for seniors, because they um, often revert to only their first language as they get older. So it is going to be critical that we provide those services, and the local Ontario health teams will have that responsibility. What a complete plan. Yeah. Complete plan. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Last week, I was so pleased to hear the Minister outlines a new version for education in Ontario. I know that after years of the failed ideological programs, students in my writing of Don Valley Notes are falling behind. They are leaving school without the basic skill they need. Ontario was once a world leader in education, and I believe with this plan, it can be again. Can the Minister of Education tell us what our government is doing to ensure that Ontario students will once again be global leaders in subjects like Question. math, science, and technology? Minister of Education. Don Valley North, you're doing a great job. Yeah. 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 This member from Don Valley North is 
doing a great job staying connected with his constituents, and I really appreciate it receiving the positive reaction and response from your riding about our plan for education yeah, yeah, yeah. to yeah, get yeah. it back on track in Ontario. So thank you for that. And I can tell you what we're doing in terms of getting Ontario back in, on track with regards to STEM, science, technology, energy, or, and, <laughs> engineering, and math. But there's so much energy, energy I can't energy. even begin to tell you, Speaker, for the plan that we have. Because after 15 years of failed ideology that the member mentioned and the experiments that the previous Liberal administration chose to do on our Recovery students math. absolutely failed our Response. students. So what we're doing is we are going to be investing in a four-year strategy where we're going to be rolling out math that's going to get back to the yeah, basics yeah. and focus in on arithmetic and multiplication. And Thank you. Sure Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Through you, through you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. I'm so pleased to hear you mention how we are going to be preparing students for the future. And I am confident that this plan will help bring our education system into the 21st century. I also know that we need to be providing our students with the best support inside and outside our classroom. Can the minister explain how the government will continue to involve parents and support teachers in providing quality education? Minister. Because I want to share with you that we are embracing a team approach to making sure that our students are supported in math. You know, we recognize that parents are the primary educators, and we're going to make sure that they have all the resources they need to make sure that they can support their students at home. Because we believe very strongly that parents should be teaming up with teachers to make sure, again, that our students are getting back to the basics and focusing on the competitiveness and the knowledge that will help them be global leaders. Speaker, we feel that when we combine parent support with some of the best teachers in the world that we have right here in our Ontario classrooms, we're setting our students up for success. And to that end, we want to see our teachers succeed as well, and we're going to be investing in them. Any teacher that wants to take additional qualification courses in math, we're going to be investing with them and working with them because our government Spots. we're getting education back on track in Ontario, and we're going to get it right once and for all. Order, order, order. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Hamilton East, Tony Creek. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Hamiltonians are demanding answers about why a scathing report was buried for five years showing that the Red Hill Parkway was not constructed properly. Hamiltonians also want to know why the provincial government never said anything about its own reports, which showed that the asphalt on the parkway was steadily getting less safe year after year. Between 2012 and 2015, there were twice as many crashes on the Red Hill Valley Parkway compared to the nearby Lincoln Alexander Parkway. Seven people lost their lives. Will the Premier apologize to the people of Hamilton on behalf of the province for failure to raise the alarm bell about the Red Hill Parkway problem? The Minister of Transportation. Questions refer to the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I would uh, like to thank the uh, member from Hamilton East Stony Creek on asking that question. I have great respect for that member. I consider him one of my friends in this legislature. And, uh, Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, we've uh, uh, looked at this uh, situation, and I, I do have to remind the member opposite that the study that he's speaking of that uh, is lost is a municipal study uh, that uh, is somehow, uh, I, I, you'd have to ask the municipality and I'd answer where that study is and why it's not been released yet, but uh, the MTO has collected data, um, and we have released that information that we collected uh, between 2007 and 2014 on four lanes in the four-kilometer stretch, uh, the Red Hill Valley Parkway. 
Uh, the data collected in the four kilometre section showed the pavement friction met MTO satisf satisfaction and were typical of other stones approved to be used in asphalt placed Response. on busier highways in the province. Mr. Speaker, the member is asking a question to the municipality. I refer him to ask the municipality for those answers. Thank you very much. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster, Dundas. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, my question is back to the Premier, and I would say that the people of Hamilton do not want to get caught in this, this being bounced back and forth. They deserve answers. Yeah. They deserve to know who knew about the problems with the Red Hill Valley Parkway, who did they tell, and what did they do about it. This is a very serious matter. Above all, Hamiltonians need to know why they were kept in the dark all those years. When there were reports showing that the roadway was getting slippier each and every year. So, we would like to ask will the Premier do the right thing and pick up the tab for the cost of a judicial inquiry so the people of Hamilton can get the answers that they deserve? Members, please take your seats. Question could refer to the Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks again for that. Uh, Question, uh, Speaker. Uh, MTO had no role in Hamilton's 2013 you know study. Hamilton's study was completed by a consultant using a British friction testing methodology that isn't used by MTO. Friction testing is one of many considerations when identifying a section of highway for additional monitoring or potential remedial measures. The ministry, when they're doing their testing, looks at the layout of the highway, pavement age, traffic conditions, and collision data. MTO's approach is to achieve friction by selecting an appropriate pavement type for the surface layer and allowing pre-approved, high-quality, durable aggregates to be used in that layer. Mr. Speaker, I don't know what went on with the City of Hamilton with regards to that study or why that study hasn't come forward. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we weren't a part of that consultant study as the ministry. And I, again, I refer the member opposite to please contact the, uh, the, the city of Hamilton and, and request the information that you're asking for. They should be presenting that data to you that you've been requesting. Thank you. Next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Hi, uh, Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. This past fall was particularly challenging harvest season for farmers in Sarnia Lambton and across Ontario due to the unprecedented levels of lomatoxin mold on last year's corn crop. The impact of Dawn was both hard hitting and far reaching. I heard from many farmers who not only struggled to sell their crops but were also concerned about not having enough feed for their livestock. Yesterday, the minister attended the Grain Farmers of Ontario's March Classic. Well, he got to hear from farmers <coughs> and speakers who are a growing momentum for the Canadian grain industry, its reputation, and their own business. However, he also got to hear about concerns facing the grain industry, such as the possible reoccurrence of vomitoxin in the future. Could the minister please tell the House about the work the government has done to assist farmers impacted by Don? Minister of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and I want to thank the member from Sarnia Lambton for that excellent question. Yesterday, I, had, I did have the pleasure of attending the Grain Farmers of Ontario March Classic in London. I heard not only about the impact of Dawn, but once again about the dedication and resolve of our farmers and our farm families. We are launching a cost-shared program through the Canadian Agriculture Partnership to provide special assistance to farmers experiencing extra cost due to the dawn. We are extending the Commodity Loan Guarantee Program repayment deadline for the years of 2018 and 19 program. I've also asked the federal government to initiate a formal assessment under the Ag Recovery Framework. Our government respects the values of farmers and we will be there to assist them through the challenges they face. We want to show that not only is this the government for the people, it's also Response. the government for our agriculture community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. I appreciate all his hard work advocating on behalf of Ontario's farmers, farm families, and especially those who were hard hit by vomitoxin last fall. Agriculture and agribusiness are of vital importance to our province's economy. I'm proud that our government has made expanding our agricultural industries a top priority. This government appreciates the hard work of our corn farmers and the enormous value of the entire sector to our economy and to our rural communities. Unpredictability is a fact of life for our province's farmers. However, I'm glad that this government is committed to innovation 
in developing future solutions to threats like Dawn. As farmers prepare for the year ahead, can the minister please share more details on what is being done to minimize the risk of Dawn and its impact on Ontario's farmers now and in the future? All right. Minister. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member for the su supplementary question. I've taken steps to prepare for this year's harvest, including co-funding the Ontario Corn Committee study that examined which varieties of corn were most susceptible to dawn. Ah, I've hosted numerous roundtable discussions with industry representatives impacted by vomitoxin to understand their concerns and to see how our government can help alternate, find alternate markets for the high dawn corn. This week, I was pleased to announce the change to production insurance that will help farmers if we ever experience this situation again. The program will now allow tiered salvage benefits so we can provide different levels of assistance depending on the crop damage. Mr. Speaker, running a farming operation is not an easy way of life. It is critical that our farmers have the support they need available year-round. This government is here to support our farmers and our rural communities with the resources they need every step of the way. Here, here, here. That concludes question period for today. Point of order, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. I'd just like to take a moment to welcome members of my uh, Queen's Park and constituency team for being, to being here today. Laura Nguyen, Ohana Oliveira, Amar Khan, Janessa Duran, and Lena Pulido. Welcome to Queen's Park. And a point of order, the member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Speaker, today is the first day of spring, and March 20th is also the first day of Nowruz, the Persian New Year. On behalf of my colleague Goldie Gamari and all my colleagues in this house, I would like to wish all those celebrating Nowruz a very happy and healthy New Year. Nowruz at on Piruz. There are no deferred votes. This House stands in recess until 3 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs>